The method is very simple. In, in one sense, it's extremely simple. So let me talk about that and, this, and people can just follow this prescription and actually get started meditating in two minutes now. Not have success within two minutes, but the basic method itself is not hard to understand. So let me describe it. You adopt a sitting posture, <clears throat> and this can be done in an ordinary kitchen chair or any chair at all. One that allows you to sit up reasonably straight is normally the recommendation. So your, your bottom is on the seat of the chair and your back is not supported by the chair. And in the beginning, and when I say in the beginning, I mean in the first 20, 30 seconds, simply move your hips around forward and backwards and maybe left to right and then lift your chest a little bit and bring the chin back in uh, so that the head and neck move further over the centre of your balance and so on. And just have a feel of your body in that position. <coughs> that is the first instruction. And now what's interesting to me, having listened to many, many people grapple with these instructions, is, and this is why I spent, you know, 35 years of my life developing the stretching system that we have now, is because many modern people, the first instruction to feel your body literally does not connect. They can hear the words, feel my body, they understand the meaning of the individual components of that sentence, but they don't actually feel their own bodies. It's amazing so that's that, that, is, that that is actually a continuum, that you go yes. from, that you're right, that before starting any of this kind of work that I'd done with you, you know, all of my practice had been very much neck up. And the sensations that I felt, I thought, well, that's the maximum level yes. of granularity that I can feel. But mm. looking back, it was really just gross sensations, like really blunt mm. stuff. And actually mm. you can go deeper and deeper and obviously doing a 10 day Vipassana retreat where you're mm. fully focused on the, the little atomic movements within your body, you realize there's so much richness in what you can feel. Well, it, there's, there's a universe inside you. <clears throat> Simple as that. Anyway, so that's the first thing. You're sitting on a chair and you're feeling your body. And, and let's say in the beginning those feelings are not clear. And we'll come back to that because for most meditators, <clears throat> and your experience on that 10-day retreat, you may have some comments on this, most meditators' overwhelming experience on their first retreat is pain somewhere in the body or... or <laughs> Yeah, um, is that is that connecting? Oh my okay, God. We'll, we'll we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that, and the reason we'll come back to that. And please remind me about that because whilst pain, whilst physical pain is a common experience on a retreat, it is completely unnecessary. And as you know, that was my entry into teaching meditation in Buddhist monasteries in Asia was taking that set of teachings to the, the home of Buddhism and having and, and working with, with students, sometimes long-term meditators have been meditating for as long as I have, but to bring that physical component so much more explicitly into the meditation practice completely transformed their own practice because what it does, and you've already commented on this, it brings you out of your head, which is where thinking happens for most people, and into your body. Now two things happen here, but we'll come back to that because I'd like to just briefly encapsulate the method, otherwise I'll, I'll end up talking for an hour and still people will be at the feeling the body state. So, so you're sitting on a chair, so we're still 10 seconds into your first experience of starting to learn how to meditate. You're sitting in a chair, you can perhaps feel your bottom bones against the hard wood of the chair if you're sitting on a wooden chair. And then we posit what's called the meditation object. Now, as you noted in your own podcast on meditation, the standard recommendation for the meditation object is, well, it's normally described as the breath. And, and also, too, that there are some terrible instructions given about watching the breath. Don't watch the breath. I'm going to say that is a serious misdirection and yet it's the very first experience or the very first instruction that many people have in their practice and it's one of the reasons why the, the practice doesn't bear the, the fruit that it can. The instruction that I much prefer is feel the movements in your body we call breathing. Breathing is a word, it's a concept, it's not 
breathing itself. And just like in that, that old Zen parable about the finger pointing at the moon, we want the experience. And if you want the experience of something, you it, it I should say, meditation is an embodied practice. Now everyone says that, but what does that actually mean? It means that the body that you're in right now, sitting on that chair, feeling your bottom bones, that is the body that we will meditate with. No one else's, none others, not at any different point in time or space, this one sitting on the chair right now. My body, your body. So some people recommend closing your eyes or softening your gaze if that, if that connects with you, but, it, it, but all these practices can be done with eyes wide open too if you want. It's just that for most people, because the visual cortex is their main mode of stimulation these days, it's probably helpful to reduce the stimulation on the visual cortex. And the easiest way to do that is just to lower your gaze to a metre or two in front of you and then let it softly go out of focus. But we'll come back to that because you can do it with eyes closed as well. <clears throat> okay, so as you sit there feeling your bottom bones on the seat, you become aware, or you will become aware if you direct yourself to the movements that we call breathing, you'll become aware that in fact your body while sitting on this chair is anything but still. It's actually moving subtly all the time. And we, we can put some labels on some of these movements that might be helpful. For example, when you breathe in, feel what happens in the body when you breathe in, or find the movements in the body that we would label breathing in. Now, we don't prescribe these things because some people, for example, would much prefer the sensation of the breath at the nostril, so we might describe that as a kind of one-pointed concentration, or it might be that the person who's trying these instructions the first time is actually aware of the space of the whole room that they're in. One is not better than the other. The question to be answered at all instants in your practice is what is happening now? It is so much more subtle and it's so much simpler than everyone will tell you. But what you'll observe as soon as you identify either the nostrils in the narrower focus or your tummy which is my preference. Most people can feel their tummy. I'm using tummy in the, the non-anatomical sense of just feeling the body <clears throat> from the ribs down to the hips, let's say. That part of the body there, we might, if we're going to be technical, we might say your abdomen. Feel what happens in your abdomen as you breathe. This is fascinating. And, it, and so let's say... As you breathe in, you feel something. I don't want to preempt what you might feel, but as, you, as the breath goes out, it's a different something. It's a related something, but it's a different something. And as you say, it's rich. It's rich. And not only is it rich, there is no limit to how deeply you can go into it. But here is what happens. If you're sitting there doing the feeling as I suggest at some point in your practice we might be 30 seconds into the first minute or we might be a minute in a thought will come into your mind you will notice that a thought has come into your mind and that is your first act of meditating meditating is about noticing what's happening and so as I speak about in this little introduction to meditation, I've heard many, many people say, well, it was I had a really bad meditation practice today, and the teacher will say, what, what do you mean a bad meditation practice? What happened? And the person will say, well, I noticed that I was being constantly distracted. And if you're working with a good teacher, they should say something like, well, actually, that is meditation. Noticing that you're being distracted, and yet... When you, when, you, uh, when you become aware that your awareness has followed a thought, noticing that your awareness is no longer in the movements in your body, because remember, that's the primary meditation object, and your task, as far as you can, is to hold your awareness, and this critical next word, hold your awareness gently on your meditation object. 
because it's possible, and I've seen this happen a million times, the people with um, strong concentration and, and usually with good intellect as well, they will screw themselves down and yep. literally force themselves to follow those sensations. So that's that's just being harsh on yourself, and, that's, and believe me, that's a dead end too. Um, but but that, we'll discuss that later perhaps. So my suggestion is when you notice that your awareness has moved from the sensations in your body which we are setting ourselves up somewhat artificially, I agree, as our primary object. When you notice that your attention has moved towards the thought stream and you're starting to engage in what it is that you're thinking about and then you remember, oh, that's right, I'm meditating. I'm supposed to be aware of what's happening in my body in terms of the movements. Then don't be harsh on yourself, just smile to yourself. I, oh, I always just laugh and just say, there's that mind again, you know, doing the thing that it does well, which is to distract us all the time. Now in the beginning, you may find that it's very difficult to do that, but please don't say you, to yourself, and so many people do this, oh, I, I can't meditate, I'm just too distracted all the time. No, what, what the practice is simply this, as you notice more often that you're being distracted by your thoughts, you smile to yourself and you gently bring your awareness back to whatever your meditation object is and you gently stay with that and stay with that until something else happens. That's all. And what's happening in the process of you noticing that your awareness has been drawn away by your thoughts and then gently bringing your awareness back to your meditation object, you are strengthening your capacity to concentrate. This is a profound gift to give yourself. Now I'm not talking about strengthening your capacity to concentrate so you can be more productive or any of those other instrumental things that people so often talk about in relation to this. No, I'm talking about being more aware of the processes inside you that are even more you than your mind. That's what I'm talking about. And it does have all sorts of benefits and we might talk about those later if we ever talk about, for example, well, I'll mention it now. Everyone in their life has some aspect of themselves which they experience as sticky and by that, by that I mean let me talk from personal experience that'll make the point clearly and simply I hope but for many many years the big problem that I had personally was irritation slash anger but always lurking so when things were not satisfactory and that's I use that word deliberately because I remember talking to a student once uh, and I use the word, the, the Pali word dukkha, which translate, is normally translated into English as suffering. And this guy said to me, he looked at me scornfully and said, there's no suffering in my life. I'm just looking at his face and I'm seeing the face of suffering. And, I, and so I reframed what I said. I said, okay, no suffering. But what about unsatisfactoriness? And he just cracked up. He said, there's plenty of that. So look, the, this, again, this is the, the trap of words. We do not want to get trapped in some kind of conceptual understanding of this practice. No, it is a direct, embodied, physical practice. And look, I'll add one thing and then please ask me some specific questions. What, what the beginning meditator does not know yet because they have no experience of it, except perhaps for... Um, acts of contemplation which have manifested by themselves at some stage in your life where you were sitting watching nature or watching the moon come up or something, whatever it is, and you realize that you're actually lost in the direct experience of that thing. And people will label such experiences as mystical or ecstatic experiences. In fact, those experiences, that wonderment, uh, are available to you all the time. But in order to access them, you have to, and listen to these next words because they're critical and this is partly my contribution to this art. 
the when we directed your attention to the sensations in the body that we call breathing and this is not an obvious thing but when you actually experience sensations in the body you are present meaning you're not in your thought stream and the thought stream I should add this detail as well and and people will probably find this very objectionable but thoughts in the thought stream sense thoughts are never experienced in the present they are always thoughts about the future a future which may or may not come or their thoughts about a past even if we're talking about the past of only a second or two ago the th thoughts do not occupy the present moment and for many people that is a it's a truly shocking thing to contemplate for a moment well what what do you mean Oh, and, then, and then someone's mind will always go along this path. Well, does that mean when I become a good meditator, I'm going to lose the capacity to use my mind constructively or productively? Or will my learning, the, the six years I've just spent at med school, will that suddenly vanish if I become a meditator? No, of course not. What will be taken away from your mind, though, is its obsessiveness. Now, when I say obsessiveness, what do I mean? Well... Who listening to this conversation has not had the experience of waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking about something and not being able to put that thing down? Well, the answer is everyone, right? Yeah. If someone has not had Absolutely. that experience, I, I, I want to talk to them because maybe they're like Pabna Sambhava and they, and they came into this world fully enlightened. <laughs> Uh, floating down the Ganges River uh, on a lotus blossom, that's possible, but I've not met anyone like that in my own life. The people that I regard as having transformed themselves, and that's as far as I go, I won't talk about enlightenment because I think that's a, a totally fanciful thing to even consider as a person who's contemplating, will I begin to meditate or not? The most important thing by far in the meditation instruction is to do it. That's the first thing. And secondly, to really pay attention to what's actually happening, not what you think is happening. And the way to do this most honestly with yourself is to attend to your physical sensations, because I'm going to make another big claim here. And the claim is your body has only one language, and that is the language of sensation. And most sensations in the beginning are experienced on a three axis or not a three axis that's incorrect on a continuum where you have unpleasant sensations at one end you have pleasant sensations at the other end and somewhere in the middle here are sensations that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant in the beginning your capacity to distinguish between these things is limited and that's because we in our culture are simply not trained to either to attend to our sensations except when they are painful and you know they're bothering us or they're disturbing us in some way but in fact what most people don't realize is that your body is talking to you all the time and its language is sensation now why should we care about this i mean i know i have met plenty of people who regard their body as fundamentally an impediment to doing what it is they want to do you know i can't stay awake for long enough or blah 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 I will argue that the only things that are really important to you in your own life are the things that the body experiences. And let me just describe what I mean by that. The experience of sexual pleasure, for example, or the experience of eating good food, or the ex experience of holding someone who you love and who loves you. This is something They're, you you mentioned in your in the last episode, where you said that it is only the body that can experience the present. And you said mm. just before that thought is always a marker of time. It's always the symbol of something slightly in the future or the past, even if we're thinking the thought at the time. And I think it's a bit of a weird claim to make until you experience. And I think the only time I truly felt that at a, at a real intuitive level was the 10 day retreat when I mm. felt that every thought has a physical counterpart and mm -hmm. vice versa. And it's almost as if the thought that is associated with any sensation is 
like the time stamp. It's the the marker in time that of that precisely. physical precisely what it is. sensation. Yes. So that um, that method that you've really clearly described there. Hopefully, anyone listening who is procrastinating about meditation and what to, what style to do, or, or has heard some of these previous um, recommendations of people saying watch the breath or whatever, and um, not really got it. Hopefully, that's enough to. Um, stimulate them to do it and and most people listening to this will have been lifting weights for at least some time and so it's going to seem you know if someone came up to you and said oh i'm thinking of starting to lift weights but i don't know whether to do daily undulating periodization or linear progression or five three one you'd be like well look man just go in the gym and just do something just do five by five and they'll be like oh but is it really optimal you'd be like it doesn't matter just (laughs) just get in and do something so i think that that message of just sit on the cushion and do it 